Hey scholars, just a quick video. Uh, a few of you had mentioned batteries in your discussions of acids and bases. And so I did want to briefly talk about those for those people who were interested in knowing more. And yeah, that's a meme from Starship Troopers. And they had a common phrase in there, which was, would you like to know more? So if you're not familiar with that movie, it's a great movie. Ask your parents first though. So lead acid battery, um, the idea with lead acid batteries, also known or seen a lot of times in cars, is that the reactions that occur with the lead, which allow that lead to transfer electrons, uh, those reactions can be coupled together so that those electrons have to flow through a circuit. And that's how you can provide current in order to be able to start your car, keep your car running. And the reactions rely on the presence or the use of sulfuric acid. And that sulfuric acid, remember that first hydrogen is the only strong hydrogen, strong electrolyte part of that sulfuric acid. So the HSO4 minus is normally how we would think about sulfuric acid existing in solution unless it's uh, dilute enough or reacting with another base as was often the case with our net ionic equations, in which case for those reactions, we typically simplified it a little bit more and just said that it dissociated all of the way because this is relatively strong compared to other weak acids. But in solution, especially acidic solutions like your car battery, the sulfuric acid concentration is high enough where there's so many protons in solution, so much H plus, that the HSO4 minus, the hydrogen sulfate ion, really will not be able to dissociate further. And so in your car battery, you do have a lot of this hydrogen sulfate ion that comes from sulfuric acid. And this can react with one of the terminals on the battery and those terminals are made from solid lead or lead metal. And when that reacts with that lead metal, the lead metal doesn't go anywhere. It's just that that lead metal turns into this lead to sulfate, which is still a solid. So this forms on the surface of the electrode and that liberates the proton from the hydrogen sulfate and two electrons from the lead. And then those electrons can flow through the circuit. When they get to the other terminal, the other terminal is made of a lead oxide, which again is still a solid, and that reacts again with this hydrogen sulfate ion that's in solution, along with even more protons and those two electrons that came from the other plate to make lead sulfate as well. So both electrodes are turning into lead sulfate, lead to sulfate, but the difference here is that the lead on this plate started out as lead four, with an oxidation number of four, or often a charge of four plus is the other way to think about it. And the interesting thing here between both reactions is that we're really using up some of this sulfuric acid. And even the H plus here that we're creating, we end up using three of them in the other half reaction here. And so when we combine these two reactions, because remember, if you have oxidation, that has to be coupled with reduction. These can't happen on their own, otherwise we wouldn't really have conservation of matter or conservation of charge, because these electrons really can only be transferred, they can't be created or destroyed in chemical reactions. So when we put these two together, what ends up happening is we end up consuming the sulfuric acid that's in the solution and creating more water. And so this is why sometimes with batteries, you can use something called a hydrometer to measure the specific gravity, also sometimes called the density of the solution. And the more discharged a battery is, the more used up it is, the lower the concentration of the sulfuric acid will be. And the lower the concentration of sulfuric acid, the lower the specific gravity. And the closer to one this would be, which would be pure water. So the more charged a battery is, the more fully charged it is, the higher the concentration 
of sulfuric acid in the solution and the higher the density will be of that solution. And so this is one reason why you can also use um, car chargers. You can use little plug, wall plug-in uh, char battery chargers if your car battery runs down a little bit. And it's because you can reverse this reaction within the car battery to take both plates that have a coating of lead sulfate on them and reverse that reaction so that the lead sulfate on the positive plate turns back to this lead four oxide and the lead two, lead two sulfate on this negative plate turns back to the lead metal. So that's a lead acid battery. Um, the acid concentration itself often determines the kinds of reactions that can happen. So for permanganate, this ion here, this is purple in solution, and it's often used in analytical chemistry because it is a very strong oxidizing agent. It can oxidize other compounds. And you can look for the amount of the other compound that gets oxidized in order to be able to analyze the solution that you're, that you're titrating or that you're testing. And when you do that titration, that purple color from the permanganate, the permanganate's going to react with your sample as long as you have sample present. And so when you're titrating that purple color from that solution, that purple color goes away because the permanganate reacts right away. When you get to the equivalence point in your titration, the permanganate will be perfectly balanced with your reactants, your other reactants, and even just one tiny drop more of the permanganate solution will be enough to make your whole solution turn purple. So while it's reacting, while you still have sample present, your solution might be a little bit purple, but then it goes back to colorless. As soon as you've reacted with all of your analyte, that little bit of excess permanganate is able to turn the solution purple. But for this to work, our solutions really need to be pretty acidic. And so this particular reaction is the reaction that occurs with permanganate in very acidic solutions. And the permanganate 2 or the manganese 2, here on Wikipedia they're saying it's pale pink. I think that's really only if you have a lot of it present in solution at a very high concentration. So that would be the pale part. Realistically, the permanganate is so purple that com the concentration of the, perm the permanganate compared to the concentration of the manganese is basically purple to colorless. The problem is when you're doing these titrations, if you don't keep your solution acidic enough, then the mechanism changes for this reaction. If it's not acidic enough, the most common problem with these types of analytical titrations is that you actually end up forming this solid manganese dioxide or manganese four oxide. And that, because it's a solid, to makes the solution turn very brown, and that makes it impossible pretty much to see when the purple color goes away. And so if your solution in the titration is not acidic enough, then this is the reaction that takes over. But you can also, instead of making the re, uh, solution very acidic, you could also make the solution very basic and they left out the hydroxide here, but in a strongly basic solution, this is the reaction that takes place. And we actually see the permanganate, the manganese seven get reduced to manganese six. And uh, so this all depends on pH and how many protons and how many hydroxides are around. And that all dictates the uh, mechanism which remember is how the reaction happens. And because all three of these reactions really could happen at the same time, but they all depend on the amount of protons or the amount of hydroxide, they're all gonna have different speeds at which they happen. And the one that's very acidic is going to be the fastest reaction when the solution is very acidic. So that's why that's the only one we really worry about. So not only can pH change the kinds of reactions that occur, but we also have batteries besides acidic batteries like the lead acid battery or the car battery, we also have batteries called alkaline batteries. 
And alkaline batteries are called such because they have potassium hydroxide or at least very large amounts of hydroxide within the batteries. So now the reactions within these alkaline batteries really depend on zinc. Look, here's that manganese dioxide again, or that manganese four oxide. And notice how the zinc reaction, the zinc reacts with the hydroxide and this manganese dioxide creates hydroxide. So two hydroxides are consumed, two hydroxides are produced, so for these kinds of alkaline batteries, they really don't change their hydroxide concentration at all. And that's good when you're trying to design batteries and design the containers because you can design the container for one specific concentration of hydroxide. And so these mechanisms, these reactions only occur in alkaline or basic solutions. If you took these alkaline batteries and tried to make them work in acid, these would not be the reactions that would occur and you would not be able to take the same materials that go into these batteries to create um, batteries with an acid solution instead of an alkaline solution. And so these are the typical alkaline batteries that you might buy from the store unless you're buying some sort of a lithium or a lithium ion battery. And those have different uses, and those are still redox reactions or oxidation reduction reactions, but those are also going to depend on acid-base chemistry in different ways. And so these alkaline batteries, these are the types that you're probably most familiar with for AA and AAA and even the 9 volts that you might see in things like smoke detectors. If you have the TI-83s still or 86s um, or... 84s maybe, I can't remember what the most common models were that some of you guys had, but those typically use the uh, AAA batteries. You might also see AAA or AA batteries in your um, remotes for your TV or your stereos. And C batteries are typically used in things like the larger flashlights and stuff. So um, again, this was just kind of a quick overview for some batteries. Just to point out some of these pages that are here on Wikipedia that you could look at if you'd like some more information. Um, I can also help you out if you come into Zoom or email. I can give you some more information on these. And um, again, if the desire to know more has intensified, just let me know. And I'm happy to go over more stuff with you on batteries or oxidation reduction reactions. Um, there's a whole wealth of chemistry that would normally be covered at, in some way with high school chemistry that we haven't gotten to. And if you want to try to learn some more of that uh, on your own in the last few weeks of school, um, even after the packet three is complete, just let me know.